Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Q Society's sixth webinar of this year. I'm Nora Dennehy, and I am the Vice Chair of the Q Society. And this evening, I am delighted to welcome as our speaker, Chris Mills. Chris was the former head of Art and Archives at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew. And before joining Kew Gardens in 2006, Chris oversaw the Learning Resources Centre at the Roehampton campus of Greenwich University. Then he served 13 years at the Natural History Museum as head of collections and services. In 2015, Chris decided he was going to hand over the reins at Kew to fulfill other pursuits. He's produced and collaborated on a number of publications, notably contributing items to both Prince Charles's Highgrove and Transylvania Florilegiums. In 2016, Chris published The Botanical Treasury, the tale of 40 of the world's most fascinating plants. He's also curated several exhibitions, most recently the World Garden Exhibition at the 2019 Beijing Horticultural Expo. Kew's Library Art and Archives is one of the most important botanical reference sources in the world and contains more than half a million items, including books, botanical art and illustrations, photographs, letters, manuscripts, periodicals, biographies and maps. Precise and finely worked botanical paintings continue to play an important role in plant ecology, recording species and their characteristics in, with an accuracy and an, anatomic, an anatomical detail that a photograph cannot. And Chris is going to talk to us tonight about some of the botanical artists who have captured the flowering of Kew Gardens in art. But now, Chris, it's over to you. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak to the Society uh, on the flowering of Kew Gardens in art. Normally, one thinks of Kew Gardens as flowering in the very literal sense of living plants producing flowers or other means of reproduction, and often in ways that naturally or due to the skill of horticulturalists are spectacular. This living show, though, is often in each individual case brief, last in a few weeks, days, or even as short as a day in some cases. For the scientist, a record of the flowering event and indeed the entire life cycle and structure of a plant has always been important. And so for this reason, behind the scenes, the gardens has, since its foundation, created a collection of dried plant specimens so the form of a plant can be viewed and studied even when the living plant is dormant or no longer present. Here we have a herbarium specimen. Frequently, at the same time as these specimens have been collected and preserved, sketches and or a watercolour portrait of the plant will also have been created, as in this case. Since the earliest days of the creation of the gardens at Kew, as both a royal pleasure ground and a botanic garden, the successes of the cultivation of thousands of species brought as seeds, saplings and small plants to this world garden have been recorded by numerous talented botanical artists, royal patrons, their advisors and subsequent directors of the gardens who have all employed artists to capture the likeness and splendour of plants and their flowers, both as a record of the species grown and to share the information with other individuals and institutions on these plants that were frequently new to science. In this way, Kew has created a secondary form of flowering, one that admittedly was seen by only a small number of people until quite recently, but a flowering of the plant world visualized and captured in an art collection. I will return to the opening up and increase in the accessibility to this other flowering world later. Kew's principal art collection is now made up of over 220,000 original works, mostly watercolours on paper and vellum, line drawings, pencil sketches and prints. Here we have an example of each of these. There are also some oil paintings, but with one exception, these are mainly portraits of various notable botanists and Kew characters, 
The core of the collection is drawings of plants and the parts of plants which the staff at Kew tend to refer to as plant portraits. The one exception is the Marion North collection, which is mostly oils, but unusually Miss North applied her oil paints to paper rather than canvas. I'll return to this particular collection later, as it is in many respects quite distinct from the main botanical artworks that Kew holds, not least as most of it is permanently on display in a gallery of its own. In addition to the original works of art on paper, the collection is supported by thousands of printed items, many lovingly and beautifully hand coloured, such as these plates from the Temple of Flora. These, date, these plates date from the 1400s and through all the intervening years to the present day, such as the Highgrove Flora Legion published about a decade ago. Similarly, Hidden within the manuscript collections of our archives are many notebooks and letters which contain delightful, curious or outstanding sketches and illustrations, such as these by Thomas Baines from his travels in South Africa, or these of John Day, which are in his, as he called them, scrapbooks. Due to the size and international nature of the art and book collections at Kew, although assembled for other reasons, namely to support scientific endeavour, now serve to give a good representation of the history of botanical art of the world over the last 500 years. In my talk tonight, I will concentrate on the most exceptional of those artists who've worked at the gardens, but the art collection does contain the work of numerous other artists. Many of these will never have been to Kew, but who on expeditions or working in other botanic gardens around the world recorded in paint the plants they saw growing. So the collection is now comprised of works both made at Kew and also purchased, commissioned and donated from elsewhere. The latter have enhanced the overall breadth of the collection, but many of the artists most closely associated with the gardens are among the most highly regarded, prolific, technically capable and innovative innovative in the history of botanical art. From the first royal flower painter through to the present day, the lives and output of artists associated with Kew is replete with interesting stories and a legacy of knowledge and beauty. Pictures in the collection range from a sketch a few millimetres wide drawn on a scrap of paper, such as this sketch by Charles Darwin, through to items of several feet in width and length where the only practical way to store them is rolled around a large tube as with this Japanese nature print printed from the actual leaf of the plant itself and measuring just under one and three quarter meters long and nearly a meter wide. Represented within the collection are some of the finest botanical artwork that's ever been produced technically perfect, but also stunning to look at. Work from the 18th and first half of the 19th century, often referred to as the golden age of botanical art, is a particularly strong part of the collection. The masters of this period, all represented in the Kew collection, though only three worked at Kew, including Pierre-Joseph Redoute, George Dionysius Eret, Walter Hood Fitch and Ferdinand and Franz Bauer. Let us start with the last of these, Franz, or as he is sometimes anglicised, Francis Bauer, Kew's first royal flower painter. Both Franz and his brother Ferdinand were born in Feldsberg, at that time in Lower Austria, and now known as a Valtese in the Czech Republic. Both exhibited exceptional talent as artists from an early age. Their father, Lucas Bauer, court painter to the Prince of Liechtenstein, died when they were both very young. But despite this loss of their teacher, they were encouraged to continue their artistic endeavours. Their skill was recognised and an opportunity to deploy it in the field of botanical art came to them when Norbert Bosius, an ardent naturalist, became the abbot of Feldsberg. He employed Franz 
Ferdinand and their older brother Joseph to make paintings of plants to what became known as the Liber Regni Vegetabilis. Between them, the brothers did most of the 2,750 paintings of plant specimens in this floral legion. In 1780, Franz and Ferdinand relocated to Vienna, which offered more opportunities to talented artists and engravers. Their skill was again quickly recognised and Franz began to illustrate works for various clients, including the famous naturalist Nicholas von Jacan. Exact details <clears throat> of all Franz's activities in Vienna are scant, but he stayed until 1788. In that year, in the company of Jacquin's son Joseph, Franz left Austria and after visits to several parts of Europe, arrived in England in November. In London, Franz was introduced to Sir Joseph Banks. Banks recognised what an exceptionally skilled artist Franz was and persuaded him with the help of a generous £300 salary to accept a position as flower painter at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. Sir Joseph Banks was the dominant figure in English scientific society at the time. He had accompanied Captain Cook on his first voyage around the world as a naturalist. The experience he gained on this expedition, allied to his existing scientific knowledge, his inquiring mind and great wealth that allowed him to purchase specimens and sponsor expeditions, made him a trusted advisor to many. He remains the Royal Society's youngest and longest serving president, a post he held for 42 years. His connections included the royal family and he was a major figure in the lane of foundations for Q to become a major international institution. Bauer took up his post in 1790 and remained at Q for the rest of his life. He principally drew plants that were cultivated in the gardens, but also specimens frequently dried and devoid of their living colour brought back from many expeditions. Franz became a highly skilled botanist and extended his artwork to make drawings of microscopic details some of his depictions of pollen grains have been shown to have details, the accuracy of which was only confirmed after the electron microscope was invented. He's perhaps best known for the Strelitzia. The Strelitzia was one of the plants collected by Francis Masson, who undertook Kew's first ever plant hunting expedition. This was to South Africa. After the plant flowered at Kew and had been described, Banks had it named in honour of Queen Caroline, who came from Mecklenburg Strelitz in Germany. In addition to his botanical painting, Bauer also gave lessons in painting to Queen Charlotte and her children, who frequently stayed at Kew Palace. This is one of the paintings of Princess Charlotte, tutored by Bauer. For his contribution to science, Franz was made a member of the Royal Society and also appointed botanic painter to George III. I should note here that a considerable number of paintings Bauer made at Kew were bound into volumes and named the Kew Plants Collection. This is one of them from that volume. These volumes became the property of Queen Victoria and for reasons that are not entirely clear, she presented them to the British Museum. They now reside in South Kensington, having been transferred there from Bloomsbury when the Natural History Museum as a separate branch of the BM was established. I have probably been in the unique position of having spent 13 years at the Natural History Museum defending why those volumes should remain there and then 10 years stating it would be quite nice if they were returned to Kew. Bauer died in 1840, aged 82, and is buried in the churchyard of St Anne's Church on Kew Green. Inside the church is a marble memorial to him, on which beneath his portrait sits Strelitzias, Banksias and some of the tools of his trade, palette, brushes, paper and microscope. Whilst Franz put down roots at Kew, his brother Ferdinand travelled widely. The first circumnavigation of Australia being just one of his notable expeditions. He died in March 1826, aged 66, 
Sadly, no known portrait of Ferdinand exists, somewhat surprising given his siblings were all artists, and unlike Franz, he has no memorial, though he does get mentioned on Franz's memorial as being the only artist who could equal his brother. The memorial to Franz reads, in the delineation of plants, he united the accuracy of the profound naturalist with the skill of the accomplished artist to a degree which has only been equaled by his brother, Ferdinand. Bauer was followed at Kew by Walter Hood Fitch. Fitch was born in Glasgow in 1817 and began his artistic career in Scotland as an assistant to the topographical artist Andrew Donaldson, where he became skilled in the art of lithography. He moved on to become an apprentice fabric designer, working for Henry Monteith, a mill owner, and a friend of Kew's future first official director, William Hooker. Hooker recognised what a talented artist Fitch was and brought him out of his apprenticeship and set him to making drawings of plants for him. These he used to illustrate his lectures and his books. Fitch's ability to do lithography was also called on for the latter and also to make illustrations for Curtis's botanical magazine of which Hooker was the editor. Here's a plate from Curtis. In 1841, Hooker was appointed Kew's first official director, and on moving down from Glasgow, Fitch accompanied him to become chief artist at Kew. Fitch went on to become the most prolific artist Kew has ever had. He worked on numerous books, and the range and scale of his work is considerable, almost unbelievable. For the time he ceased working on Curtis's botanical magazine, he had produced over 2,700 plates, mostly in colour, and many of which he also did the original artwork for. He produced over a thousand line drawings for Bentham's Handbook of British Botany. He also worked on some of the most spectacular large format colour plate books of the 19th century, including Joseph Hooker's Rhododendrons of Sikkim Himalaya and illustrations of Himalayan plants, such as this magnolia. One particular anecdote anecdote gives an idea of how skilled an artist Fitch was. As he was under constant pressure to produce paintings and lithographic plates to meet publishing deadlines, he came up with the ingenious plan to omit making a finished original watercolour and using just his preliminary sketch as the basis to draw the final version directly onto the lithographic stone. When William Hooker learnt what Fitch was doing, he immediately stopped him from the practice as it meant there was no final original artwork to be kept, as after printing, the lithographic stone is wiped clean and reused. To make an original drawing directly onto the stone, which was in reverse of how it would finally be printed from no master is extremely difficult. I think these next two slides show something of Fitch's technical and artistic ability. Here we have detailed cross sections of the Victoria Regia, now Amazonica, and also his rendering of the flowering plant for the published volume. In addition to his painting and plate production, Fitch, like Bauer, was also expected to teach pupils the skills of botanical art. And we'll come later to look at some of the work of one of his best pupils, Matilda Smith. To illustrate the range of his skills, it's interesting to note that in addition to the work making plant portraits that he was paid to do, he also recreationally returned to painting topographical scenes. This was a side of his output that was unknown until about 10 years ago, when a donor kindly presented the library with three pastoral scenes of Kew Riverside. These are quite impressionistic and much unlike his formal scientific work. Just recently, this picture came to market. Again, it's really quite different in style, and I would love to be able to find out whereabouts this was in queue, because obviously nothing in queue today looks quite like this. In 1880, Fitch was awarded a pension from the civil list, and in partial retirement was able to work in a more relaxed manner. He died in 1892, aged 74, after suffering a stroke. Let us move now to Sir Joseph Hooker. 
Although he's most, notice, most noted as the foremost botanist of the 19th century and Kew's second and probably most illustrious director, Joseph Hooker was also an accomplished artist and it would be remiss not to mention him in this look at Kew's finest artists. I do not have time to go into any detail about all his life's work, so this is just a brief glimpse to show his artistic skill. The son of William Hooker, Joseph was a keen naturalist from an early age. He trained as a doctor and as an assistant surgeon on an expedition to the Antarctic, which began in 1840, he made the first of his now famous travels. Wherever he went, Hooker made copious notes, detailed his observations in letters back to his family, and he drew. After the Antarctic expedition, he traveled at various points in his life to Morocco and the Atlas Mountains, California, and most notably to India and the Himalayas. On all these trips, he drew the landscapes he encountered, the everyday objects that people used, decorative features, and of course the animals and plants that he came across and collected. In November 1847, Joseph Hooker left England to embark on his second and most notable expedition. Arriving in Calcutta on the 12th of January 1848, Joseph spent the next four years collecting plants and making observations on meteorology, zoology, geology, and the people and places he visited. He traveled all over India, but spent much of his time in Sikkim and in neighboring Nepal. Hooker collected thousands of plants and made hundreds of drawings as he explored the Himalayas. Most notably, he collected and sketched many species of rhododendrons. He sent both specimens and drawings back to Kew, along with his extensive notes on the plants. From these, William Hooker employed Fitch to make finished drawings of the new species. And even before Joseph returned from India, his famous work, The Rhododendrons of Sikkim Himalaya, had been published. During his travels, he kept up a detailed correspondence with his close friend, Charles Darwin, sending observations on geology and animals, as well as plants, in response to the many, many questions that Darwin posed. Such evidence was vital to the development of Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. Joseph responded most viscerally to natural landscapes and plants, rather than man-made beauty. However, his sketchbooks and notes show that he took a considerable interest in the people he encountered. He made a record of items in everyday use, such as household implements, toys and jewelry, and of the plants and medicines sold in the bazaars. He also sent many items made from plants back to the museums at Kew, always trying to make a note of their local names and uses. In his pursuit of new plant species, Hooker ascended to a higher elevation than any European had probably ever previously achieved. In a sketch he made on one of these forays into the high Himalayas, he made what is the earliest known illustration by a European of Mount Everest. Dated 1848, the Everest sketch was made long before the mountain was known by that name and it would not be recognized as the highest mountain in the world for another eight years. Early in 1850, Hooker relocated to Assam for nine months, where with the help of numerous local guides and collectors, he amassed over 2000 species of flowering plants, including many stunningly beautiful orchids. Hooker returned to Calcutta in December and in late January 1851, boarded a steamer to return to England. In moving to the artist who is perhaps the one most associated with Q by many people, we enter into an artistic debate. Are Miss North's paintings botanical art or are they topographical and flower painting? Her style is certainly different to the formal approach exemplified by Bauer and Fitch. One sees no white paper in most of Marianne's pictures. Before trying to answer this question, let us consider how Miss North came to painting. Marianne was born into a wealthy upper middle class family and might have been expected to do little other than secure a good marriage for herself, but she was a woman with quite different ambitions. As was normal for the time, Marianne was tutored in music and art and singing was her original passion. 
following an illness which affected her voice and also having an acute nervousness at performing in front of people, she transferred her principal energies from music to art. Marianne's life was constrained by a promise she made her dying mother that she would care for her father and until her late thirties, her travels and the paintings she made while on them were confined to the well-trodden paths of Britain and Europe. On the death of her father, however, Miss North was set free and able to begin to follow the dream that she'd conceived as a child to visit the tropics and other exotic places. This is a dream that first began to take shape following her visit to Kew Gardens where Sir William Hooker, a friend of her father, gave her a bunch of Amherstertia nobilis flowers. When Marianne began her travels, she did not set out to create an ex a collection for exhibition. Painting primarily for pleasure, she developed a personal record of the places, animals, and particularly the plants she encountered on her expeditions. In 1879, though, she did exhibit a selection of her paintings in London, and encouraged by the positive response to this, on the 11th of August 1879, while waiting for a train at Shrewsbury Railway Station, she composed a letter to Sir Joseph Hooker, now director of Kew, proposing that she give her paintings to Kew and fund the building of a gallery to house them. Sir Joseph accepted her offer, recognising the importance of her paintings as an aid to educating the public and as an historical record of plants, many of which were, and I quote, already disappearing or are doomed shortly to disappear before the axe and forest flower fires, the plough and the flock, or the ever advancing settler or colonist. A sadly prescient observation Hooker made in the preface of the Marion North Gallery's first catalogue. By placing her extraordinary global pictorial diary for Kew visitors to see, she helped satisfy the curiosity of those who could not literally follow in her footsteps. At one level, her gallery gave pleasure, but it also educated, informed and inspired. Her pictures literally expanded people's view and understanding of the natural world. North's style is in many respects unique. She always used oil paint, whilst conventional botanical art is always executed in watercolour. For this reason, some botanists are dismissive of her, of her art as she does not conform to the conventions of botanical illustration in this and in other ways. Such dismissal fails to appreciate the educative qualities of the pictures. Whilst they may not be botanical illustration, her works are certainly studies from nature as she captures the essential elements of the species that she depicts. And by using oils, she gives her subjects a vibrancy and impact that other botanical art can sometimes lack. Her painting, more than one species per picture, showing background plants, occasionally animals and other features, provides an environmental context which the non-specialist can more easily understand and respond to. Marianne's sister Catherine observed that she had a feeling for plants more akin to a human relationship and this intimacy comes through in the way that she depicts her subjects. Certainly one thing that she had in common with the three male artists we've previously looked at is the prolific production of paintings she achieved. The gallery she funded holds 848 of her pictures showing plants from 16 countries and in addition to these many more of her paintings or sketches are housed in the gardens library and also in the possession of her family's descendants. It is likely many others exist around the world as frequently on her travels, Marianne would thank the person who provided her with that day's accommodation with a painting that she had produced overnight. So to return to the question I posed earlier, is her art botanical? To the purist, probably not, but even they cannot deny its effectiveness at being educative to the wider public, and in many ways anticipating by a century what many current artists are trying to do in conveying environment as well as the form of a plant. Due to a disagreement between Joseph Hooker and Fitch in 1877, the former found himself without a principal artist for Curtis's botanical magazine. 
Hooker's daughter Harriet had received some training in botanical art and temporarily stepped in to make paintings, but was soon succeeded by Matilda Smith, one of Hooker's cousins. Smith remained in her post for 42 years and over this period created 2,300 plant portraits and plates for the botanical magazine. 1,500 illustrations for Hooker's Iconis Plantarum and was one of the first artists to begin making paintings of the flora of New Zealand. Probably the painting Miss Smith is most famous for is the one that records the first flowering of the Amomorphalus titanum, also known as the Titan Arum or corpse flower. It is infamous for its odour of rotting flesh, an effective adaptation for attracting pollinators but a very unpleasant experience for anyone standing close to it or sitting trying to paint it. It's probably one of the two paintings Matilda would recall as the most eventful to make. The first Titan Arum to bloom at Kew was in June 1889, one of the small plants given to Joseph Hooker 10 years earlier. The inflorescence began to emerge in early June and growing at a rate of about three inches a day it reached its full height of six foot nine inches 17 days later. Hooker described the event in Curtis's Botanical Magazine. Unfortunately, the flowering stage was so rapid that it was witnessed by few, and by them at the expense of enduring an atrocious stench resembling that of Bulbophyllum thakari, which rendered the tropical orchid house at Kew unendurable during its flowering in 1881. I should be wanting in gratitude if I did not here express my deep obligation to the talented artist of this work, Miss Smith, who, in her efforts to do justice by her pencil to these plants, suffered in each case a prolonged martyrdom that terminated in illness in the case of the orchid. In both cases, Matilda could only draw for a very limited period and then had to leave the glass house to revive in fresh air. Miss Smith's endeavours were rewarded in 1898 by her becoming the first, first official artist of Kew Gardens. The genus Smithiantha in the Gisneriad family was named in her honour, and also the genus Smithiella, although this name has now subsequently been changed. In dedicating the genus to her, Stephen Dunn, a botanist at Kew, wrote, this genus is respectfully dedicated to Miss Matilda Smith, and the specific name of the first species, Smithiella miriantha, not inappropriately refers to its innumerable flowers, as well as to the very large number of beautiful drawings and paintings of flowers with which Miss Smith has for so many years decorated the botanical magazine, the Iconis Plantarum and the Kew Bulletin. Smith retired in 1921, though continued to contribute paintings for a further two years. She was also in 1921 named an associate of the Linnaean Society of London, only the second woman to be so honoured. She died in 1926. It may interest those of you familiar with the inside of St Anne's Church that Smith was chosen to design a portion of Joseph Hooker's monument wall tablet. Encircling the profile of Hooker are five gracefully drawn plants by Smith each representing a region of the world that had been prominent in Hooker's career. Clockwise from the top right, the plants are the white collared pitcher plant of Malaysia, Rhododendron Tomsonai, a rhododendron from India, the black eyed daisy from New Zealand's sub-Antarctic islands, Chinchonia calisea, the Peruvian tree introduced into India with Kew's assistance as a source for quinine, and a Dutchman's pipe from tropical Africa. Time prohibits me saying much about the final artists whose work I would like you to see. You can find out more about them both on the web and they all feature in various of the books that Q has published, particularly since the advent of the Shirley Sherwood Gallery of Botanical Art. The creation of this gallery, along with digitization and the internet, and the opening of the beautiful library reading room has significantly altered the audience that Q's paintings can now have. 
In the past, the paintings were largely only accessible to the scientific community. And so some pictures, one to 200 years old, may perhaps have only been examined by a few dozen people during that time. Those same pictures may have been viewed by 10,000 people in a single exhibition outing in the gallery. So to end up, a quick overview of some of the outstanding women artists of the 20th and 21st centuries. And it is largely women who have been the most proficient artists of recent times, with some exceptions. But few of the major male artists of recent decades, such as Rory McEwen, have been very closely associated with Q. Lillian Snellin. Snellin was a professional botanical artist for her whole life. She first worked for five years from 1916 at the Botanic Garden in Edinburgh, but then moved to Kew and worked there for 30 years. She was the chief artist for Curtis's Botanical Magazine, but also worked on a number of monographs, including Stern's Genus Peony. Here are some examples of her work. Here, quite unusually, she's depicted this lily on grey paper. I would observe here that there must be something very healthy about being a botanical artist. Snellin lived to be 95, and the next two artists I'm showing you a quick glimpse of their work, both lived into their centenary year. Mary Grierson. Unlike so many of the artists who worked at Kew, arriving when young and staying until retirement and beyond, Grierson did not begin working at Kew until she was nearly 50 having prior to that had a career as a cartographer. From 1960 onwards, she became a, a major contributor of plates to Curtis's Botanical Magazine and plain, painted splendid colour pictures for a number of important monographs such as Matthew's Hellebores, Hunt's Orchidaceae and the Hawaiian Floral Legion. Stella Ross Craig was another of those artists who spent her entire career working at Kew from 1929 through to 1973. She's a highly regarded artist who spent 25 years making line drawings for the Drawings of British Plants. At the same time, between 1949 and 1970, she was the chief artist for Curtis's, Curtis's Botanical Magazine. She also produced beautiful colour paintings for a number of other now highly regarded and collectible titles, such as Asiatic Magnolias in Cultivation. And one of my favourite pictures of hers is this exquisite Banksia with incredible detail. Finally, three living artists. Christabel King. Christabel has been active at Kew since 1975 and produced a great many paintings for the Botanical Magazine since then, as well as for many other publications. For me, her work depicting cacti is particularly outstanding. Since 1990, Christabel has been tutoring a Brazilian botanical arts student each year. These promising young artists are enabled to come to Kew under the Margaret Mee Fellowship Scheme. As a result of this, Brazil is now one of the countries from which some of the most interesting and innovative botanical art is appearing. Masumi Yamanaka was born in Nara, Japan, but came to London in 1987 to work for Marks and Spencers as a ceramics designer. After becoming a freelance designer, she worked for various ceramic manufacturers. Following training to be a botanical artist with Pandora Sellers, another artist who has a long association with Q, she illustrated a number of monographs as well as contributing illustrations to Curtis's Botanical Magazine. Probably her most ambitious undertaking to date has been to create an artistic record of Kew's heritage trees. The results of this project were on display in 2015 in the Shirley Sherwood Gallery. Finally, Rachel Pedder-Smith. Rachel's had a long association with Kew and produced a number of fascinating paintings as a result when she undertook to do her PhD at the Royal College of Art in London, it seemed logical to utilise Kew in some way. The result is a massive major botanical painting depicting 703 dried specimens in the herbarium 
from 505 flowering plant families so that at least one member of every flowering plant family is represented. The watercolours are arranged across seven large sheets of paper and when placed end to end the painting measures 18 feet long. This work entitled the Herbarium Specimen Painting required 766 days of painting with an average of seven hours work a day. Hedda Smith chose to use herbarium specimens rather than living material because she wanted to interweave history into the work. In addition to the spread of families, there is also one specimen collected in each of the years that the herbarium had been in existence. Many of the specimens were collected by important names in botany, including Joseph Banks, Charles Darwin, and Joseph Dalton Hooker. The painting builds on some of her earlier work, such as this, the bean painting. The botanical art is often referred to by historians of fine art as not really art, because the paintings that are created are conceived from a place of scientific accuracy rather than an artistic impulse, inspiration, or an aesthetic concept. It is true that a scientific drawing requires a precise representation of the plant, and that this is more important than an impression, original composition, or embellishment of certain features. To see such drawings as only illustration is, however, to misrepresent the skill and beauty of the paintings. The supporters of the notion that botanical art is not really art, only illustration, will often also say that it's all rather samey, a single thing floating on a sea of white paper, and in style has not changed in centuries. I hope that in what I've shown you tonight, I have disproved this. While within our collection, there are indeed many examples of a single specimen floating on a sea of white paper. It is not the whole story. And I would note, by the way, that I feel it's derogatory to refer to or dismiss illustration as if it was something not worthy of a true artist to do. It is an extremely skilled profession. And on that note, I come to an end. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, it was lovely to see so many beautiful illustrations. Um, I was just absolutely fascinated to see some of those um, illustrations um, and uh, just blown away by the, the detail of some of them, absolutely exquisite. Um, so Chris, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us tonight, showing, showing us all these beautiful, beautiful works. Um, we really appreciate um, your time this evening. Um, I'd also like to say a very big thank you to the uh, staff of the National Archives. They've been um, working behind the scenes to try and sort things out for us. And as always, they are uh, excellent hosts. And last but not least, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Um, I do hope that you're going to join us again um, in June. We have another talk, another webinar on Wednesday, the 16th of June at 7 p.m. And this time we're going to be looking at a natural history of tonic water. So that sounds like it could be quite interesting as well. So I do hope you'll be able to join us. Um, but in the meantime, um, I think all that remains is to say thanks again to Chris and to wish you all a very pleasant evening. Good night. <laughs>